Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We are gathering in fellowship today on the 11th of the fourth month. I was wrong last week. I'm sorry for that. But today, as we reckon it, to the best of my knowledge, is the 11th of the fourth month. It's the second Shabbat of that month. And it is the 24th of June, 2023, on the Gregorian calendar. We are continuing, and we should... Ob willing finish up the book of Hanok today. We're on chapter 98, and these are still the exhortations that Hanok gave to his children during the year that he was given to dwell with them after he was shown everything that was. If you recall, a little bit of a timeline, he's taken at his 364th year from creation he's shown all the things by the messengers and then he's sent back to his sons to share these things and to give them the books so that's what he's currently doing right now he had received visions both of the soon coming flood of, of his day and of the events of the future for his children and all the posterity unto the first and second coming of our mashiach and now he's trying to instill the idea of doing right into his children so they have a good end. This is chapter 98. <clears throat> it says, And now I swear unto you, to the hakam, or wise, and to the foolish, for you shall have many fold experiences on the earth. For you men shall put on more adornments than a woman. Uh, think about kings in particular, okay? And colored garments more than a virgin. In royalty and in grandeur and in power and in silver and in gold and in purple. And in splendor and in food they shall be poured out as water. Therefore, they shall be wanting in doctrine and chokma, and they shall perish thereby together with their possessions, and with all their esteem and their splendor, and in shame and in slaughter and in great destitution, their inner beings or souls shall be cast into the furnace of fire. Where the worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. Okay. This is why our Mashiach said, what is it to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? What is it to walk around in riches and splendor when there's the people that you're given to, to care for are in poverty and destitution? While they're living the good life now, like Lazarus and the rich man, they're going to get their desserts when the time comes. And again, that was something that was reiterated already in the book of Hanok. What's in store for the leaders, the rulers, the landlords, right? And the kings of the earth, which if you've been following along, they are almost all of them directly from the tribe of Yahuda, and those over the children from the line of Dawid. Okay, this is established throughout quite a few books in scripture and you can see it playing out both in secular history and otherwise yes a comment from one of the people in here is that they love using colorful garments and, and ties and things like that on on shows they do they dress up they put on pomp and, and show and splendor they make big scenes out of things and that's why our Mashiach said that the things that are highly esteemed upon earth by men are an abomination to Elohim because we're doing these at the expense of others and at the uh, we're depriving people of necessity for luxuriousness, which is something that we're all going to have to give an account for if we do that. But it says... And in silver and in purple, and in splendor, and in food, they shall be poured out as water. 
They shall, therefore, they shall be wanting in doctrine and chokma, and they shall perish thereby together with their possessions and with all their esteem and their splendor, and in shame and in slaughter and in great destitution, their souls shall be cast into the furnace of fire. I have sworn unto you, you sinners, as a mountain has not become a slave, and a hill does not become a handmaid of a woman. Even so, sin has not been sent upon the earth, but man of himself has created it, and under a great curse shall they fall who commit it. And barrenness has not been given to the woman, but on account of the deeds of her own hands she dies without children. I have sworn unto you, you sinners, by the Kadosh Great One, that all your evil deeds are revealed in the Shemaim, and that none of your deeds of oppression are covered and hidden. That's a theme that's pretty much universal. The, the power of the Almighty is incomprehensible. He literally is in, within all finite things and is not contained by anything. He knows the, the secret thoughts of the hearts and nothing is hidden from him. It says in Sirach that his eyes are like 10,000 suns. And that, and even the Mashiach, the mediator between Elohim and man, El the Word, who by the will of his Father was given authority over all things, he himself is in the mind of all men and knows their thoughts. So there's nothing that we can do, say, or think that will be hidden from the Almighty it's recorded that the messengers above, Hanok himself writes down the sins of the people as they are committed. So we don't get away with anything. The easier we, the, the quicker we realize that, the better off we'll be. And it's the same thing as if you think about a child. A child will not do the thing that they know to be wrong when their parents are watching them. At least if they're in the right mind, right? Verse 8, from henceforth you know that all your oppression wherewith you oppress is written down every day till the day of your judgment. Woe to you, you fools, for through your folly you shall perish, and you transgress against the wise, and so good hap shall not be your portion. Good happenstance, right? And now... Know you that you are prepared for the day of destruction, the day of Abaddon in Hebrew, if you remember. And that word for Abaddon it does not just mean destruction, but that's also the name of a false mighty one called Apollyon in the Greek, which uh, that's a play on words. It means Apollo, the destroyer, right? And that was their false son, mighty one who was into foretelling and usurping things it is literally what the nicolaitans worship and have uh, convinced most believers to venerate destruction abaddon but it says wherefore do not hope to live you sinners i'm sorry I didn't mean to do that. I accidentally moved that word. Oh, I did it again. There we go. Sorry about that. And now you know that you are prepared for the day of destruction or Abaddon. Wherefore, do not hope to live, you sinners, but you shall depart and die, for you know no ransom. For you are prepared for the day of the great judgment, for the day of tribulation and great shame of your souls or inner beings. Woe to you, you obstinate of heart, who work inequity and eat blood. Whence have you good things to eat and to drink and to be filled? From all the good things which Yahuwah Elion, or the Most High, has placed in abundance on the earth, therefore you shall have no shalom. Woe to you who love the deeds of unrighteousness. Wherefore do you hope for good hap unto yourselves? 
know that you shall be delivered into the hands of the righteous, and they shall cut off your necks and slay you, and have no mercy upon you. Right. Shaul mentions that we have to be this way until our obedience is complete, and then we will be able to punish disobedience. And that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but when you look at the Psalms, it talks about the innocent that are like lambs with a, with two-edged sword in their hand, ready to punish the nations. It's that theme of when our when we are fully obedient and we turn from the things that we're doing wrong in the wilderness, that's when Yahushua will bring us into the land, right? The the themes have always been here. We just don't comprehend them correctly because we've been confused. But the conditions for what brings us to the promised land and to our inheritance have always been there. They don't change. And it's made very evident by, um, like the book of Revelation says, that the the woman, the bride has prepared herself, meaning she's she's wearing white garments and made ready for her husband. The recognitions of Clement Kepha clearly says that when men repent, when we as a people collectively turn to our creator, that's when things will change, right? He mentions in Hosea that he will not return in enmity to his people. And the reason why he's been so long in what he's doing and the things are the way they are is because the people have not repented of the wrong that they should know not to do since he came. He literally said, before I came, before the truth was made known, they had no sin. Now that I have come, there is no excuse for their sin. And we are living out the fact that there is no excuse. So the, the quicker that we realize these things and we take it serious and we repent from the heart, the, the better off we'll be, both individually and as a people. It says, woe to you who rejoice in the tribulation of the righteous, for no grave shall be dug for you. Woe to you who set at naught the words of the righteous, for you shall have no hope of life. Woe to you. Remember what the woes were? And if you're not familiar, the three woes that are mentioned in Revelation are literal fulfillments of events in history. And these are the woes that our Mashiach and his body, consequently the world, would have to go through during these times because of what's being done. It's mentioned in the book of Gad the Seer. What these three woes were in relation to the truth, our Mashiach, and literally the truth in history. And then in Revelation, you see them actually culminating. It tells you the events happening in the stars and the things that would be done on earth in regard to them. The first woe was the coming of the Byzantine army or the Roman legions after the time of, that Catholicism came to power, where they used their crossbows that they called scorpions and their iron armor, and they said, convert or die. This is known in history with the uh, Council of Nicaea, the Edict of Thessalonica, and the uh, a lot of other things, but the militant converter die mentality was it's satanic and contrary to the truth. That was the first woe that happened because of the things that were going on. The second woe began at the uh, the publishing of uh, Wycliffe's translation of the Bible into English in 1390. And he used the Latin Vulgate, which did not have the Nomnia Sacra. It did not have the accurate placeholders for the proper tr uh, pronunciation or transliteration of his name. And they just used titles and words that they carried over from the Latin, which is how we have Lord, God, and uh, Eosus or Jesus in the English instead of Yahuwah, Elohim, and Yahushua, which was literally the beginning of the second woe, which culminated in around 1834 with the Yerushalayim earthquake. 
between 1390 and 1834, his name was taken out of the world. And that was the second woe where his refuge would be lost, right? The refuge of the, of the, the poor, the refuge of our Mashiach, the refuge of the, the destitute, and the fatherless is the name of Yahuwah. It's all through scripture, and that's literally the events that happened during this time. And it was a woe to the world. But remember, it says in Exodus 20 that in every place I cause or I allow my name to be remembered, I will come to you and I will barak you. So not only did he take it from us and foretold that it would be taken, but he also foretold that he would give it to his brothers and that it would be a baraka to those that he did. The third woe was where his lot and destiny was given up to, to uncleanness and defiled. All right Now his lot were his remnant, the remnant that went off into the wilderness after the Reformation was the founding of America, and the beginning of the third woe took place. How very interesting. Apparently, Joseph Smith and the creation of Mormonism was founded in 1834 with the gold plates. So thank you for that, brother. But a lot of these things all coalesce. They all have similar times. And if you look about the events, 1834, roughly 30 years before this, the third woe kicked in. Okay. In, in the third woe began at the Battle of Antietam, where we lost over 22,000 men in the Civil War of America, where over half a million, 500,000 Protestants killed each other at the behest of Rome with Catholics on both sides and Freemasons on both sides, pitting real believers against each other. And it was fighting against fighting. They took out half a million Americans and then flooded the country with Catholics and literally infested the cities and took over the, uh, the voting. When you can outvote in the districts where it actually counts with the electoral uh, sway in the cities versus the rural areas, which is all part of the constitution that was supposed to be amended and corrected. It was known, it was talked about, it was suggested by Washington during his term in office. But after the Civil War, it was never implemented because it was the very fact that it wasn't done was used by our enemies to still our country. And that's why we don't have honest elections and haven't since the Civil War. Just so you know, it's only getting worse. And until we repent as a nation, our enemies will continue to have reign over us. But this is literally what happened and how it was foretold. So the third woe, where his refuge and lot, his lot and destiny were given over to his spoilers, and he was touched by uncleanness until evening, was the beginning of, like I said, the Civil War, the Battle of Antietam, and the loss of our country to usurpers. And then, just as Yahusuf in Egypt was given at the right hand of Pharaoh uh, power and authority, and he was used to bring all goods under the dominion of Pharaoh, the sons of Yahusuf in the world today, culminating in Germany, America, and Britain, Britain being Ephraim, Germany and America being the half tribes of Menashe, right? All of the, all three of them being the sons of Yahusuf, they've been used by Rome to take all the resources of the world, including the men, their land, and their property, their money, right? For the use for Rome. And it was foretold in the patriarch's life how he walked it out. And it's literally what was going on in history. There is no reason. If you don't know these things, it's not hard to look into the, the fact that there's three city-states that rule the world today. You got Vatican City, the London, the London Business District that was originally burned down and rebuilt in 1666, right? It became its own city-state and Washington, D.C. And those, the, the three-headed eagle from 4th Ezra is that beast system that's currently ruining the, the world and all of that's being allowed to happen because the people 
are doing contrary to the to what the Bible says. It is it's pretty simple. But that was a long long sidetrack here. Ob willing, whenever you see these woes and who they're in store for, now they'll make more sense in context and how they actually played out in history. All right, their fullest culmination is the the woes of Revelation and how they play out. Okay. But it says, Woe to you who write down lying and unrighteous words. For they write down their lies that men may hear them and act unrighteously toward their neighbor. And that is the whole point. If you look at all these deceptions, all these lies, every single one of the Gnostic influences that try to or are swaying people, the entire goal for them is to mistreat others. It's what it leads to. It's the inevitable fruit of it. And that's how you can know it's not from him. Therefore, they shall have no shalom, but die a sudden death. Chapter 99. Yes, the city on seven hills. There, there's quite a few. The idea that Rome is Rome. We'll get to that in more detail for anyone that's interested. I mean, if if people make comments on this video that they really want to see this, then we'll do something earlier. Or if you guys all want to, we can go into it in detail. But the idea of Rome still being in control until our Mashiach returns is literally established just by the Bible itself. You don't need anything else. There's four beast kingdoms that we're going to come about, and then the stone kingdom, not hewn by a hand, was going to crush the feet and destroy them all, right? The, the first was Babylon. The second was the Medo-Persian Empire. The third was the Grecian Empire. And the fourth was the Roman. The Roman Empire has never gone away. It's changed form, which again... That was foretold in 4th Ezra. That was also foretold in Daniel. His second vision about that terrible beast. It was foretold in 4th Ezra. It was foretold in 2nd Baruch, in Gad the seer. Um, it's expounded upon in the apostolic times by believers. Rome is explicitly condemned as that beginning fourth beast. And it's actually, I believe it's Tertullian or Tertullian, uh, I believe that was him, but he actually makes mention that the restrainer that has to be brought or taken out of the way before the, the lawless one can come is the pagan Roman Empire. And once that falls and is broken up into 10 kingdoms, then the coming of the anti mashiach would be ready. And that actually is what happened. So, these things are unequivocally known. They're known, you can, you can know for certain just by the Bible itself. You can know even more emphatically when you look at the apostolic writings and what they say in regard to these things. Not only was it known that the anti-Mashiach would come from the tribe of Dan, which Dan uh, did evil to his brother in the land. They broke the covenant early. They were into idolatry and they went out and did other things. The tribe of Dan was against their brother when they sacked Troy. The tribe of Dan was against their brothers when they raided, pillaged, and plundered as Vikings. As the Tooth of Danan, they were pirates. After that time, they were Vikings. Uh, others of them were also, uh, they, they're what became the Roman Catholics of Ireland. The Tutha de Danon took over Southern Ireland. In older works, when you have, when you have people writing about the lost tribes and where they went and different things, they always attribute Southern Ireland to Canaanites or the Canaanim because of their propensity for Baal worship or then Catholicism and their antagonism against the and the other inhabitants but when you realize it's brother against brother and they're just given over to falling away then you see how his words literally play out 
and why these things are happening the way they do. But the idea that Dan would be involved with the anti-Mashiach was foreknown and talked about. Every All these things that they do, the, the stuff that they wear, the, the worship that they steal, all the, everything is enumerated, and it all points back to Rome. There's an even stronger witness when you look at what was revealed in the Dead Sea Scrolls, or the hidden writings like the Apocrypha, 2nd Baruch, 4th Ezra, they, they make them very clear. Gad the Seer mentions the Katim and Edom. Edom is mentioned as the daughter of Babel and mystery Babylon in the Psalms. Uh, you have the the idea that Edom is the Katim from the book of Gad the Seer, and then the idea that the Katim, who, if you don't recall, the son of Yepheth, the son of Noach was Yepheth, his son was Yawin, which we call Greece, and then his son was the Katim. Um, so they're they're of the Apheth, but they're intermixed with paganized Hebrews as well. Back on point, the uh, the Katim in the Dead Sea Scrolls are unequivocally mentioned as Rome in the Peshars, or what are called the interpretations of the foretellers and the Psalms by the believers that wrote those scrolls. So they would write a verse or two of some scriptures and they would interpret it and they'd give the meaning. And every time they came to different places like in Amos, Habakkuk, Nahum, all these things that had literal foretellings of things in a smaller event, like literally with Babylon, the first and things like that, they had a fuller culmination with mystery Babylon and the Katim. And that is actually explicitly mentioned how they would be pillaging, they would they would worship their standards and be military force that would pretty much plunder and rape the nations into uh, compliance. All of those things were mentioned as the Katim is what Rome was really doing and as they were at that time. So um, there's a literal step-by-step -step, one equals two equals three, you know, one plus one plus one plus one all the way through to to see that Rome is unequivocally the fourth, fourth beast kingdom and that it has never gone away. All of it can be proven just with his word, and that's what the Counter-Reformation has been working five centuries to hide, to keep this stuff confusing, to teach people things that are not true. That's why everyone believes in Jesuit estacologies today, because the Jesuits, which is the militant arm of the Roman Catholic Church, the Nicolaitans of today, they're... They are the original spies. They infiltrate, they subvert, and they pervert to control. But back on track here, uh, I wanted context for who's being spoken of. As you read these things, it'll make more sense. And as we go through them, you'll know for certain. You don't have to take my word for it. But if you want more information about that particular topic, either you, you all in fellowship or anyone that watches a video, let us know, and then if there's enough traction, we'll we'll go out of, we'll take a segue, and we'll just focus on that for a, uh, however long it takes. But back on track here on chapter 99, <clears throat> it says, Woe to you who work unrighteousness, and honor or esteem in lying, and extol them. You shall perish, and no happy life shall be yours. Woe to them who pervert the words of uprightness and transgress the eternal Torah and transform themselves into what they were not. They shall be trodden underfoot on, upon the earth. And remember, when Yonah didn't do the will of our Maker by being a light to the Gentiles, and, and letting them know what was in their best interest. He was swallowed up in the belly of the beast, in the heart of the sea, right? The sea monster had him, if you will. And in the same way, when his children collectively, the northern kingdom, if you will, and the southern kingdom in dispersion, when our Mashiach came and the good news was spread, when they refused to repent, when they would not be that light to the nations, 
they were given over and swallowed up into the belly of that beast, that sea monster known as Rome. They invaded Europe, took a land that was allotted to others, right? Contrary to what they swore they would do. So they uh, removed the boundary markers, if you will, of the fathers, which brings a curse, which was intentional. It was all part of what was going to happen because they chose not to do the right thing. And that that is the history of Europe right now. And they are trodden underfoot. Those people that are in there, even when they're not openly Catholic today, are oppressed. They're being mistreated. And it's really gone out throughout the whole world. But you can see that when you pay attention to it. It says, in those days, make ready you righteous to raise your prayers as a memorial and place them as a testimony before the messengers that they may place the sin of the sinners for a memorial before the Most High. In those days, the nations shall be stirred up and the families of the nations shall arise on the day of destruction, on the day of Abaddon, right? And in those days, the destitute shall go forth and carry off their children, and they shall abandon them, so that their children shall perish through them. Yea, they shall abandon their children, sucklings, and not return to them, and shall have no pity on their beloved ones. And again I swear to you, you sinners, that sin is prepared for a day of unceasing bloodshed. And they who worship stones and grave images of gold and silver and wood and stone and clay, and those who worship impure spirits and demons and all kinds of idols not according to knowledge, shall get no manner of help from them. And they shall become unrighteous by reason of the folly of their hearts, and their eyes shall be blinded through the fear of their hearts, and through visions in their dreams. Through these they shall become unrighteous and fearful, for they shall have wrought all their work in a lie, and shall have worshipped a stone. Therefore in an instant shall they perish. But in those days, Baruch are all who, or are all they who accept the words of Chokmah and comprehend them and observe. So it's a threefold thing. Baruch are all who accept the words of Chokmah, comprehend them, and observe the paths of the Most High and walk in the path of his righteousness and not become unrighteous with the unrighteous. For they shall be delivered because they endure to the end. Woe to you who spread evil to your neighbors, for you shall be slain in the grave. Woe to you who make deceitful and false measures and who cause bitterness on the earth, for they shall thereby be utterly consumed. Woe to you who build your houses through the grievous toil of others, and all their building materials are the bricks and stones of sin. I tell you, you shall have no shalom. Woe to them who reject the measure and eternal heritage of their fathers, and whose inner beings follow after idols, for they shall have no rest. There's no rest for the wicked. A lot of people like to believe that after you die, your your sleep, which is the it's the illusion or the parable given to righteous that that perish in this life, they are considered to be asleep, meaning that they are no longer awake in this life, but they rest. There is no rest for the wicked. And the more you learn about this, you, you know that after you die, your soul is first presented to the Father, and then you have a week to see creation for how it is. And either you're going to be rejoicing and, and uh, in shalom, or you're going to be confounded and in terror and, and based on how you lived your life. 
And after that week, you're either taken to the place of condemnation where you're close to the lake of fire and feeling the heat and looking at the place you're going to be thrown into after the judgment, or you're in the bosom of Abraham where all the righteous souls are in Shalom. And that's what they mean by rest. There is no rest for the wicked, but there is rest or a sleep for the righteous that die. I, I don't, it's not an, a pleasant thing to think about. It can be very scary, but to not know these things is to not really fear. And to not fear is to not have a regard for the future judgment. <clears throat> when you know as a fact that the worms will not die, the fire will not be quenched, and it's because the soul and the body will be ever existing and immortal and not dying, then, and you really know those things, you, you're not going to do evil. You won't lie. You won't chill. You, you won't steal. You won't even think an evil thought about someone when you know the outcome as a fact, when you really know it. Clement, in the recognitions of Clement, Kef is taught one, mentions that when fear becomes certain, or when belief is certain, fear is certain. And when fear is certain, you're not going to be doing evil, period. But let's continue. It says, For he shall cast down your esteem and bring affliction on your hearts and shall arouse his fierce indignation and destroy you all with the sword. And all the set apart and righteous shall remember your sins. Chapter 100. And in those days, in one place, the fathers together with their sons shall be smitten, and brothers one with another shall fall in death, till the streams flow with their blood. For a man shall not withhold his hand from slaying his sons and his sons' sons, and the sinner shall not withhold his hand from his honored brother. From dawn till sunset they shall slay one another. Where every hand, every brother's hand, or every man's hand is against his neighbor and his brother. That happened by the Midianites when Gideon was fighting with them, if you recall. It happened at one time, I believe. It might have been with the Assyrian army. And it will happen again, right? Says, and the horse shall walk up to the breast in the blood of sinners, mentioned in Revelation, right? And the chariot shall be submerged to its height. In those days, the messenger shall descend into the secret places and gather together into one place all those who brought down sin. And the Most High will arise on that day of judgment to execute great judgment amongst sinners. And over all the righteous and Kodesh, he will appoint guardians from amongst the Kodesh messengers to guard them as the little man or apple of an eye. The word in Hebrew is uh, like Ishon, the word for a man, but with a wanun, which makes it like the little man. Or the pupil is how they have that translated, right? But to guard them as the pupil of an eye until he makes an end of all inequity and all sin. And though the righteous sleep a long sleep, they have not to fear. I'm sorry, you might not get the connection with a little man and the apple of your eye. The apple of your eye is what has your affection and attention. The little man in your eye is literally when you look at someone. And then you look in, in their eye, you can see your reflection. It's the little man in their eye. So the one who's who's the apple of his eye is the one who he's regarding or looking upon, okay? Which is the little man of the eye. Now you have the context there, sorry. So continuing, it says verse 6. I'm sorry, 
Uh, let me finish that. Until he makes an end of all inequity and all sin. And though the righteous sleep a long sleep, they have not to fear. And the children of the earth shall see the wise in security and shall comprehend all the words of this book and recognize that their riches shall not be able to deliver them in the overthrow of their sins. Woe to you, sinners, on the day of strong anguish, you who afflict the righteous and burn them with fire. That's what happened in particular during the Dark Ages when um, the two witnesses it mentions in Revelation who would have to kill those who killed them in the same way that they were killed. That is not a literal two witnesses, but the, the Gemini, Mars, or the red one coming out of the mouth of the twin constellation was what was literally over the head of William Tyndale when he was burning at the stake, if I recall correctly. And it was from the burning of his people, which was something Rome started doing in particular at that time. Because if you remember, the Nicolaitans, the Gnostics, had secret instructions. The Nag Hammadi Library actually reveals the things that they were following from Sophia and Apollyon, but they had this hidden wisdom where they had to amalgamate the Gnostic writings with, with the scriptures and intentionally fulfill the things that are mentioned. So they go out of their way to intentionally do the things that are in those times to be done. And at this time, it was burning his body of believers with sackcloth and ashes. The retaliation or the vengeance from on high from this was the burning of the city of London in 1666 and the city of Constantinople, where the major burnings of heretics took place. So, again, these woes have literal fulfillments in histories and once you see where they are when you read these things it's perfectly fitting it makes sense and now you can see the context there <laughs> but it says you shall be requited according to your works okay woe to you you obstinate of heart and anyone who's watched the antichrist for dummies videos knows as an actual fact that the retaliate or the vengeance for the burnings there was not only those burnings but plagues the the black plague or what they called the the black death the black plague the bubonic plague would literally and there was another one called ergotism where it would literally people would feel like they were on fire when they weren't physically burning, they would see flames in their mind. They would feel like they were on fire and they could even die from it. And their hands and their, their body parts would turn black and ashed, or it would be look like they were burnt. And it was a disease that was plaguing Catholics all throughout Europe during the times where he was, the, the witnesses were being burned. But it says, woe to you, you obstinate of heart who watch in order to devise inequity. Therefore shall fear come upon you, and there shall be none to help you. Woe to you, you sinners, on account of the words of your mouth, and on account of the deeds of your hands which your unrighteousness has wrought. In blazing flames burning worse than fire shall you burn. And now... Know you that from the messengers he will inquire as to your deeds in Shamayim, from the sun and from the moon and from the stars in reference to your sins, because upon the earth you execute judgment on the righteous. And if you remember, the sun is like the bridegroom, the moon is like the Malkuth Shamayim, and the stars are like the children of light running the course up before them who knows him, who names them, and shows, shows forth him who numbers them. And don't you know that you shall judge the messengers? What about the, the, the things of this world, right? So you can see right here that they'll be inquired into. And just like these, which we are to emulate night and day, the apostolic constitution says that his assemblies on earth emulate the Shamayim powers night and day, right? The sun, moon, and stars. They're going to be judging 
Okay. Same picture. The physical here is a pair as a parable for the literal is what I'm trying to point out. Okay. And he will summon to testify against you every cloud, every witness, right? And mist and dew and rain. Let my words drop down as dew as fine rain on the tender grass. His laws and statutes are going to witness against them. Witnesses, the people, are going to witness against them. Okay? For they shall all be withheld because of you from descending upon you, and they shall be mindful of your sins. If you haven't figured out how you can be equated to a cloud or water, and how you can not be descending upon the wicked with knowledge of his statutes, laws, and Torah. Think about what he said. You don't put them before, what, pigs and dogs, but you refrain so the dew doesn't descend on them. Same picture, different way. Ob willing, people can see that. But let's continue. And now... Give presence to the rain, that it be not withheld from descending upon you, nor yet the dew, when it has received gold and silver from you, that it may descend. When the hoar frost and snow with their chilliness, and all the snowstorms with all their plagues fall upon you, in those days you shall not be able to stand before them. And remember, Gold and silver is redemption, about repentance and redemption. Hoar frost, snow, chilliness, these are judgments. These are calamities and things, and plagues are judgments against people for what they do. Chapter 101. <clears throat> Observe the Shamayim, you children of Shamayim, and every work of the Most High. And fear you him, and work no evil in his presence. If he closes the windows of Shamayim, and withholds the rain and the dew from descending on the earth on your account, what will you do then? And if he sends his anger upon you because of your deeds, you cannot petition him, for you spake proud and insolent words against his righteousness. Therefore, you shall have no shalom. And see, you not the sailors of the ships, how their ships are tossed to and fro by the waves, and are shaken by the winds, and are in sore trouble. And therefore do not fear, because all their goodly possessions go upon the sea with them, and they have evil forebodings of heart, that the sea will swallow them, and they perish therein. Are not the entire sea and all its waters and all its movements the work of the Most High? And has he not set limits to its doings and confined it throughout by the sand? And this is mentioned also in the Apostolic Constitutions. Men are afraid of the ocean and going out at sea, especially before modern technology but they don't fear their maker who has control over it. If you had that proper fear, you wouldn't have to be afraid of anything else, which is exactly what our Mashiach enjoins us to. Fear the one who can throw both your inner being and body into Gehenna, but no one else, right? And at his reproof, it is afraid and dries up and all its fish die and all that is in it. But you sinners that are on the earth, fear him not. He has, or has he not made the Shemaim in the earth and all that is therein? Who has given comprehension and hokma to everything that moves on the earth and in the sea? Do not the sailors of the ships fear the sea? Yet sinners fear not the Most High. 102. In those days when he has brought a grievous fire upon you, whither will you flee 
and where will you find deliverance? And when he launches forth his word against you, our Mashiach said that I, I didn't come to judge the world, right? My word is going to judge you, right? It's the word that he spoke that will judge men in the last day. But it says, and when he launches forth his word against you, will you not be frightened in fear? And all the luminaries shall be affrighted with great fear, and all the earth shall be affrighted and tremble and be alarmed. And all the messengers shall execute their commands, and shall seek to hide themselves from the presence of the great esteem. And the children of earth shall tremble and quake, and you sinners shall be cursed forever, and you shall have no shalom. Fear you not, you inner beings of the righteous, and be hopeful that you and be hopeful you that have died in righteousness, and grieve not if your inner being into Sheol has descended in grief, and that in your life your body fared not according to your goodness, but wait for the day of the judgment of sinners and for the day of cursing and chastisement. And yet when you die, the sinners shall speak over you, or sorry, the sinners speak over you. As we die, so die the righteous. And what benefit do they reap for their deeds? Behold, even as we, so do they die in grief and darkness. And what have they more than we? From henceforth we are equal. And what will they receive, and what will they see forever? Behold, they too have died, and henceforth forever shall they see no light. I tell you, you sinners, you are content to eat and drink, and rob and sin, and strip men naked, and acquire wealth and see good days. Have you seen the righteous how their end falls out? that no manner of violence is found in them till their death. Nevertheless, they perished and became as though they had not been, and their inner beings descended into Sheol in tribulation. And it was this very thing that caused Kepha to know as a fact that there is a future judgment, because men were not requited in this life what they deserve, both righteous and evil. So he, that, that's a proof because we have a righteous creator. There will be a resurrection and a judgment. Chapter 103. Now, therefore, I swear to you, the righteous, by the esteem of the great and honored and mighty one in dominion, and by his greatness, I swear to you, I know a mystery. I have read the Shemaim tablets and have seen the Kadosh books and have found written therein and inscribed regarding them, that all goodness and joy and esteem are prepared for them, and written down for the souls of those who have died in righteousness, and that manyfold good shall be given to you in recompense for your labors, and that your lot is abundantly beyond the lot of the living. And the inner beings of you who have died in righteousness shall live, and rejoice, and the inner beings shall not perish, nor their memorial from before the face of the Great One. Unto all the generations of the world, wherefore no longer fear their, con their contumely, their backbiting and strife, right? This is their, they're trying to cause divisions. This is said of people who usually they will do that in regard to a leader to overthrow him, right? But woe to you, you sinners, when you have died, if you die in the wealth of your sins, and those who are like you say regarding you, Baruch, or blessed are the sinners, they have seen all their days, and how they have died in prosperity and in wealth and have not seen tribulation or murder in their life. And they have died in honor, 
and judgment has not been executed on them during their life. Know you that their inner beings will be made to descend into Sheol, and they shall be wretched in their, in their great tribulation, and into darkness and chains and a burning flame, where there is grievous judgment shall your souls enter. And the great judgment shall be for all the generations of the world. Woe to you, for you shall have no shalom. Say not in regard to the righteous and good who are in life. In our troubled days we have toiled laboriously and experienced every trouble, and met with much evil and been consumed. So this is the the righteous are enjoined to take everything that happens cheerfully. All right. We we know that everything works to the tov or good of those who love Elohim and to those who are called according to purpose. So we are not to take anything that happens in our life amiss, but to realize that all of it is from him. Okay. The good, bad, and the ugly. It's all to make us perfect in truth for his for his pleasure. So say not in regard to the righteous and good who are in life. In our troubled days, we have toiled laboriously and experienced every trouble and met with much evil and been consumed and have become few and our ruach small. And we have been destroyed and have not found any to help us even with a word. We have been tortured and destroyed and hoped to see life from day to day. Or sorry, and not hoped to see life from day to day. We hoped to be the head and have become the tail. We have toiled laboriously and had no satisfaction in our toil. And we have become the food of the sinners and the unrighteous. And they have laid their yoke heavily upon us. They have had dominion over us that hated us and smote us. And to those that hated us, we have bowed our necks, but they pitied us not. We desired to get away from them, that we might escape and be at rest, but found no place whereunto we should flee and be safe from them. And think about coming to America. The, the, the Puritans, the Pilgrims, the Quakers, right? The, the original... The, the original ones that left Britain to come here, they left for to religious liberty purposes, to worship their creator according to the dictates of their conscience. And though we flayed to get away, we've had no resting place. Even here, we haven't been able to be safe from them. Okay. And are complained to the rulers in our tribulation and cried out against those who devoured us, but they did not attend to our cries and would not hearken to our voice. And they helped those who robbed us and devoured us, those who made us few, and they concealed their oppression. Most people in America don't even know our country has been hijacked. It's been slowly being usurped and more and more, though, it's more and more overtly corrupt. More and more they take away the unalienable Elohim-given rights enumerated in the Constitution. They do everything they can to violate them. And the people don't know better. But they concealed their oppression and they did not remove from us the yoke of those that devoured us and dispersed us and murdered us. Okay, still do. And they concealed their murder and remembered not that they had lifted up their hands against us. And that might be for the average Catholic today. Most Christians, regardless of your denomination, don't see any difference between Catholicism or any other flavor of what they call Christianity. In reality, Catholicism is the most satanic usurpation and mockery of religion that exists in the world today. And all the different denominations are daughters of that harlot um, because they're not following what is true. 
it is a it's a slow moving thing and it wasn't originally what was intended the reformation was a time where he was leading the blind in the way and the lame in paths that they weren't walking that was foretold and he helped the people who were in ignorance at that time so long as they were upright in their hearts and minds and seeking him but we've fallen away as a people and you can see that <clears throat> chapter 104 says, I swear unto you that in Shamayim, the messengers remember you for good before the esteem of the Great One, and your names are written down before the esteem of the Great One. Be hopeful, for aforetime you were put to shame through ill and affliction, but now you shall shine as the lights of Shamayim. You shall shine and you shall be seen, and the portals of Shamayim shall be open to you. And in your cry, cry for judgment, and it shall appear to you. For all your tribulation shall be visited on the rulers, and on all who helped those who plunder you. Everyone who's associating with Rome is going to suffer. Be hopeful, and cast not away your hopes for you shall have great joy as the messengers of Shemaim. What shall you be obliged to do? You shall not have to hide on the day of the great judgment, and you shall not be found as sinners. And the, <clears throat> and the eternal judgment shall be far from you for all the generations of the world. And now fear not, you righteous, when you see the sinners growing strong and prospering in their ways, be not companions with them, but keep afar from their violence, for you shall become companions of the hosts of Shemaim. And that's reminiscent of what you can read in Psalm 92, which also has to do with uh, keeping his Shabbat which again, it's a type and picture of the millennial reign, which is what we're all striving to enter into. And although you sinners say, all our sins shall not be searched out and be written down, nevertheless, they shall write down all your sins every day. And now I show unto you that light and darkness, day and night, see all your sins. Be not unrighteous in your hearts, and lie not, and alter not the words of uprightness, nor change, sorry, nor charge with lying the words of the set apart great one, nor take account of your idols, for all your lying and all your unrighteousness issue not in righteousness, but in great sin. And now I know this mystery, that sinners will alter and pervert the words of righteousness in many ways. And we've, we've seen countless examples of this. I'll name three. Nomnia Sacra, the placeholders that were used in the Greek manuscripts from the 3rd to the 14th century that would have you not translate his name into a foreign language or his titles into a different language, but to accurately say them the way they were meant to from the Hebrew. You were never meant to, to use a different word. That's been perverted. Since the uh, Second Vatican Council and their promulgation of multiple types of scriptures, specifically after the Westcott and Hort um, manuscripts were promulgated. You have a lot of versions of scripture that were intentionally produced by minions of the adversary to pervert the words. And then for a third witness, you can, if you studiously look into the Antichrist for Dummies videos and you test them to what is actually in the word, what is actually in history, you'll see that Almost the entire book of Revelation is inaccurately translated 
front to back. There's some places, there's, I think, one chapter that was fairly spot on, but almost every one of them has things that could be translated more correctly. And it's because of these perversions that we don't have a clear picture of what's true anymore. It, it is that simple. The fix is also right here, so I'm just going to read it. He says, and now I know this mystery that sinners will alter and pervert the words of righteousness in many ways. Our Mashiach was abused and mistreated by his own first and then handed over to Rome to be flogged and, and killed, right? And will speak wicked words and lie and practice great deceits and write books concerning their words. Right? But... And here's an example. There's the, the futurism and petrism or pretrism, right? The two Jesuit estecologies that are meant to supplant and replace uh, the historicist view or the accurate interpretation of foretelling in scripture. Okay. And they wrote many books on these topics to delude and lie to people. But when they write down truthfully all my words in their languages and do not change or diminish from my words, but write them all down truthfully, all that I first testified concerning them, then I know another mystery. See, repent first, then the fix. That books will be given to the righteous and to the wise sorry, to the righteous and the wise to become a cause of joy and of rightness and much wisdom. And to them shall the books be given and they shall believe in them and rejoice over them. And then shall all the righteous who have learnt therefrom all the paths of uprightness be recompensed. In those days... Y'all who obeyed to summon and testify to the children of earth concerning their hokma, show unto them, for you are their guides, and a recompense over the whole earth. For I and my son will be united with them forever in the paths of uprightness in their lives, and you shall have shalom. Rejoice, you children of uprightness. Amen. 106. And this is actually an interpolation, okay? This is not actually the words of Hanok, but it is the first-hand account of the birth of Noach as written by Lemek. And this is one of the, um, this very birth of Hanok is reiterated in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it's actually in the first-hand writing of Lemek there in what is called the Genesis Apocryphon which has Lemmick's writings, Noach's firsthand writings, some of Abram's or Abraham's writings, and I believe it might have been a little bit of Yaakov, but it, it's just fragments of these things, really. However, uh, this kind of got attached to what we call the, the Book of First Enoch, and now we know it was already known, kind of postulated beforehand, but now we know as a fact that it was actually written by him completely separate and it was attached to it over time and as things got muddied up this is an after some days my son methuselah took a wife for his son lemek and she became pregnant by him and bore a son and his body was white as snow and red as the blooming of a rose meaning he he was pale okay and he had a, a flush when he blushed and the hair of his head and his locks, sorry, and his long locks were white as wool and his eyes beautiful. And when he opened his eyes, he lighted up the whole house like the sun and the whole house was very bright. And thereupon he arose in his hands or in the hands of the midwife, opened his mouth and conversed with Yahuwah of righteousness meaning the suckling babe sang praises, which again was something that was talked about and alluded to later on. 
and it was culminated with the children laying down the palm branches and, and garments and singing praises as they brought our Mashiach into Yarushalayim. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, you have perfected praise, right? This is the first instance of that. First the physical, first the literal, and then the spiritual, right? This is, and thereupon he arose in the hands of the midwife, opened his mouth and conversed with Yahuwah of righteousness. And his father Lemech was afraid of him and fled and came to his father Methuselah. It's skipping out a bit. In the Dead Sea Scrolls version, which we'll cover, it actually has the conversation he had with Bet Betinosh or Beth Enosh, his wife. Or I'm sorry, that was the wife of Noah, I believe. But no, no, no. That was Lemix. I'm sorry. Either way, they have a back and forth, and he's asking her whether or not she's been with the Watchers because this is not a normal baby. <laughs> and she swears that she's the only he's the only one she's ever loved and been intimate with. So it gets a little uh it gets a little um a little more in depth in that account, but it is otherwise very similar. So he goes to his, uh, he flees to his father and he said unto him, I have begotten a strange son, diverse from an unlike man, and resembling the sons of the Elohim of Shemaim. And his nature is different, and he is not like us. And his eyes are as the rays of the sun, and his countenance is splendorous. And it seems to me that he is not sprung from me, but from the messengers. And I fear that in his days a wonder may be wrought on the earth. And now, my father, I am here to petition you and to implore you that you may go to Hanak, our father, and learn from him the truth, for his dwelling place is amongst the messengers. And when Methuselah heard the words of his son, he came to me to the ends of the earth, for he had heard that I was there, and he cried aloud, and I heard his voice, and I came to him, and I said to him, or I said unto him, Behold, here I am, my son, wherefore have you come to me? And he answered and said, Because of a great cause of anxiety have I come to you. And because of a disturbing vision have I approached. And now, my father, hear me. Unto Lemek, my son, there has been born a son. The like of whom there is none. And his nature is not like man's nature. And the color of his body is whiter than snow and redder than the bloom of a rose. And the hair of his head is whiter than the white wool. And his eyes are like the rays of the sun. And he opened his eyes and thereupon lightened up the whole house. And he arose in the hands of the midwife and opened his mouth in Baruch, Yahuwah of Shamayim. Sorry about that. You can see here that some of the typos it says, Thee, Thou blessed I, I haven't edited them apparently i thought that was done and this one was not so please forgive me but it'll be finished and we'll have this pdf available for anyone that wants it he says and his father lemek became afraid and fled to me and did not believe that he was sprung from him but that he was in the likeness of the messengers of shamayim and behold, I have come to you that you may make known to me the truth. And I, Hanok, answered and said unto him, Yahuwah will do a new thing on the earth, and this I have already seen in a vision, and make known to you that in the generation of my father Yarad, some of the messengers of Shamayim transgressed the word of Yahuwah. And behold, they commit sin and transgress the law, and have united themselves with women, and commit sin with them, and have married some of them, and have begot children by them. 
And they shall produce on the earth giants, not according to the Ruach, but according to the flesh. And there shall be a great punishment on the earth. And the earth shall be cleansed from all impurity. Yea, there shall come a great destruction over the whole earth, and there shall be a deluge, or a flood, and a great destruction for one year. And if you are familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls, it was exactly one year to the day from the beginning of the rains to its, to its end, and it was open and done. It says, and this son who has been born unto you shall be left on the earth, and his three children shall be delivered with him. When all mankind that are on the earth shall die, he and his son shall be delivered. And now make known to your son Lemek that he who has been born in or is in truth his son, and call his name Noach. For he shall be left to you, and he and his son shall be delivered from the destruction, which shall come upon the earth on account of all the sin and all the unrighteousness, which shall be consumed on the earth in his days. And after that there shall be still more unrighteousness than that which was first consummated on the earth. For I know the mysteries of the set-apart ones, For he, Yahuwah, has shown me and informed me, and I have read in the Shamayim tablets. And I saw written on them that generation upon generation shall transgress, till a generation of righteousness arises, and transgression is destroyed and sin passes away from the earth, and all manner of good comes upon it. And now, my son, and we just mentioned that it was when people repent that things will change, right? That's the condition that we we need to have for him to fix it. And now, my son, go and make known to your son, Lemech, that this son, which has been born, is in truth his son, and that is no lie. And when Methuselah heard, had heard the words of his father, Hanok, for he had shown to him everything in secret. He returned and showed to him and called the name of that son Noach, for he will comfort the earth after all the destruction. And last chapter of the book. Another book which Hanok wrote for his son Methuselah and for those who will come after him and keep the Torah in the last days. You who have done good shall wait for those days till an end is made of those who work evil and an end of the might of the transgressors. And wait you indeed till sin has passed away, for their names shall be blotted out of the book of life and out of the set-apart books, and their seed shall be destroyed forever, and their inner being shall be slain, and they shall cry and make lamentation in a place that is a chaotic wilderness, and in the fire shall they burn, for there is no earth there. And I saw there something like an invisible cloud, for by reason of its depth I could not look over, and I saw a flame of fire burning brightly, and things like shining mountains circling and sweeping to and fro. And I asked one of the set-apart messengers who was with me and said unto him, What is this shining thing? For it is not a Shemaim, but only a flame of a blazing fire, and the voice of weeping and crying and lamentation and strong pain. And he said unto me, this place which you see here, or sorry, this place which you see, here are cast the inner beings of sinners and blasphemers, and of those who work inequity, and of those who prefer 
everything that Yahuwah has spoken through the mouth of the foretellers, even the things that shall be. For some of them are written and inscribed above in the Shemaim, in order that the messengers may read them and know that which shall befall the sinners. And the inner beings of the humble and of those who have afflicted their bodies and been recompensed by Elohim, and those who have been put to shame by wicked men, who, who love Elohim, and loved neither gold nor silver, nor any of the good things which are in the world, but gave over their bodies to torture, who, since they came into being, longed not after earthly food, but regarded everything as a passing breath, and lived according, or sorry, and lived accordingly, and Yahuwah tried them much, and their ruachoth, inner beings, this should be their spirits, right? Or this should be their, their nephesh, or their souls, or inner beings were found pure, so that they should barak his name. Just like Abram, who was tried ten times and found trustworthy, and Yahusuf, right? And Yaakov, the trials that a man has in his life, whether or not you'll be obedient to the word or not. That's, that's the goal. And that's why it says in the Apostolic Constitutions that this life is our place to combat to righteousness. Right. And all the birachoth destined for them I have recounted in the books, and he has assigned them their recompense because they have been found to be such as loved Shemaim more than their life in the world. And though they were trodden under foot of wicked men and experienced abuse and reviling from them and were put to shame, yet they barak me. And now I will summon the spirits of the good, or inner beings, who belong to the generation of light. And I will transform those who were born in darkness, who in the flesh were not recompensed with such honor as their trustworthiness deserved. And I will bring forth in shining light those who have loved my Kodesh name, and I will seat each one, or, and I will seat each on the throne of his honor. And they shall be resplendent for times without number, for righteousness is the judgment of Elohim. For to the trustworthy he will give trustworthiness in the habitation of upright paths. And they shall see those who were born, born, or sorry, and they shall see those who were born in darkness led into darkness, while the righteous shall be resplendent. And the sinner shall cry aloud and see them resplendent. And they indeed will go where days and seasons are prescribed for them. And that is the end of what we call the book of First Hanok, which again, it was the only version that was found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. The second and third were not. And it's the only version that is legitimately authentic. The others might have a little bit of nuggets of truth here and there, but they have been tampered with very heavily if they had. They are not attested to in any capacity in any known writings I'm aware of. And they actually, um, when you find errors in them that are contrary to scripture, it usually has to do with what you can find in the, in the Talmud or the other writings of the wayward first covenant believers. Again, the truth was first mistreated by his own and then handed over to Rome. So we can see that in the, in the writings themselves as well. Anyone who's looked at the differences between the Masoretic text and the Textus Receptus, for example, in regard to the original covenant writings, you can see the, what I'm talking about. But of willing, this was edifying. Please... Uh, let us know if you have any comments or questions, and you all have a wonderful Shabbat and a Shavuot Tov. We'll see you next time.